to be back. I've been looking forward to this for a while. I hate not being here during services. I'll tell you what, I miss you guys. I miss seeing all your faces. All those that are traveling, it's good to see you, see you back here. We missed you guys. Glad you made it back safe. Hope you had a great time wherever you went. It's good to see everybody. Our reading tonight is going to be from Psalms chapter 23. Oh, man, this is, this is a great chapter. Give Jabari a second to pull it up. Psalms 23, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And there's just so much to unpack in that. And I love the metaphor that, that David uses of um, the shepherd, the, the way the shepherd cares for his sheep. I think it's just, to me, it's, uh, it's like a sense of calming. I don't know. Like, it, and it's, it's such a good way that and it describes God's strength and his wisdom and his even kindness. I really enjoy that, that, that chapter. Again, it's 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 just such a good reminder. I don't know, just something about a sheep and a, and a green pasture. It's just God is just he, he's he's my comfort. He's my source of comfort. I I just love that chapter so much. If the ushers would make their way, we do have a few announcements. Um, I, I just want to remind everybody back there at our info booth, we do have these little cards, great little information cards to keep in your wall, in your car, on your fridge, wherever. Just uh, little reminders of what's to come. We do have some, some good stuff coming up. I don't want to forget to announce this Sunday, of course, we have service, 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. Make sure you're here for that. Bring a guest with you. We're looking forward to Sunday. April 20th, we do have Kids Live. April 24th will be our student-led service. And at the end of the month, to wrap up April, uh, Brother Martin is going to be here with us for our anniversary service. So make plans for that. It's going to be a great weekend. I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Like I said, grab your card on the way out. Give one to a friend. Let them know what we got going on. At this time, think about our heads. Let's pray over the offering. Let's pray over those that are sick tonight, our shut-ins. Let's not forget about those. Um, let's pray over the service. Lord, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for all that you've done, Jesus. I thank you for bringing us back here once again. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, that we would, that we would leave all of our baggage outside of the doors, God, that we would come, Lord, ready to serve you, ready to worship you. God, I thank you for all that you've done. I pray, Lord, that you would touch every shut-in tonight, God. Those that can't make it tonight, I don't know if it's because of their sickness, the weather, whatever it may be, God. 
Lord, I pray, Lord, a touch upon their lives right now, God, wherever you're at, Jesus, wherever they're at, God, I pray, Lord, that you would reach your hand out upon them, that you would touch them tonight. Lord, our prayer of this offering tonight, God, I pray that you would bless those that can give and those that can't tonight, Jesus. Be with us in this service, God. Have your way tonight in Jesus' name. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one.
So come on my song And don't you get shy on me Lift up your song Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs Get out there, praise the Lord Come on my soul Don't you get shy
just want me. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. all about you. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I give you praise and honor. Come on, reach out to the Lord right now. Come on. Reach out to the Lord right now while he's so close, he's so near. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Give us clean hands. Give us pure heart. Let us not lift our soul to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure heart. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks it seeks your face, oh God of Jay. Come on. Oh God, let us be a generation that seeks. Seeks your face, oh God of Jay. Come on. Oh God, let us be a generation. Seeks your face. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Give us clean hands. Give us pure heart. 
lift our shoulders to another. Give me clean hands. Give us your heart. Let us not. I wonder if you just put your hand over. Jody, we're going to pray for your family, your grandmother, right? In the name of Jesus, we're praying for peace. We're praying for help. We're praying for healing, God. Whatever the need is, whatever's going on, I declare the name of Jesus. That your hand would be upon them. That your grace and your mercy would guide and strengthen. Walk with us today. Strengthen us today. Let your will be done. Lord, we give you the praise. God, those that are sick, those that are in need, we're asking for your touch right now. That your name would be praised. That your name would be lifted up. That your name would be glorified. We give you all the praise in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I, I like what I feel tonight in church. Uh, our children are dismissed to their classes. And uh, you have your Bibles, Jonah chapter 3. Hallelujah. Busy week coming up. Um, Sunday after church, we will be getting all the chairs out. We have the epoxy that we're going to put down. And uh, they said for it to cure correctly, um, it's, it's going to take several days. So just um, next Wednesday, I pray that you have devotions with your family. Um, we will not be having service here um, because of, of the things going on. Make sure that you are uh, want all of our church family to celebrate with us um, the Friday of our anniversary service, the 20 years, and um, it's going to be a wonderful time. I know that you're going to be blessed um, by Brother Martin. Um, he is very unique, and, and you, will, you will love that. That will be um, Friday and then Saturday we have a cookout I think is the plan and then Sunday be back um, with some services and then right after that the very next Thursday we will be hosting um, our community in this building for our national day of prayer um, I asked Connie Palatier I'm like how many years is this now we've been doing this forever and uh, I, I forgot what she said because I have a bad memory. But it's been a long time that we've been able to, to gather the whole community um, and have a prayer meeting and have some, some music that leads us into that. And uh, I'm asking that all of our church make plans, make plans to be a part of this with us. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing. All right, are you with me? Jonah, chapter 3. I'm reading, uh, to be exact, 10 verses. Uh, I just, I want you to hear the context as we dive into what we're going to talk about um, tonight. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Aren't you thankful for a God that will speak the second time? Because we often ignore him the first time and say, oh, you are talking to me. But he spoke the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. It's not your message. It's my message, Jonah, Okay. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceeding great city of three days journey to go from one side to the next. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and he cried. He waited till he got a day in. And he cried and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne and laid his robe from him. He took off his robe and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily, forcefully unto God. 
Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is uh, in their hands. So, or who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away his fierce anger that we perish not? We're not sure what's going to happen, but it may be that if we do this, that it'll turn the judgment of God away from us. And God, uh, verse number 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their wicked way and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them and he did it not. I want to talk about the uncommon the uncommon practice called repentance. The uncommon, it's not common. The uncommon practice called repentance. Will you pray with me? Lord, we love you today. We're thankful for your goodness and your grace and your love. We're thankful for your help. We're thankful that you guide us, you strengthen us. We're thankful for that. I'm asking God that you would fill this place, fill this room with your glory, fill this place with your presence that we can't afford to have one service without conviction. We can't afford to have one service without your presence being manifested. And God, we give you all of the praise. So let your word do its work in the name of Jesus. And they all said, amen. You may be seated if you smile. Looking forward in a little bit. I'm done um, as we conclude, if you will, our altar call. We're going to baptize Ryan in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of his sins. And I am excited about that. I hope you get excited about that because it is a miracle. It is an absolute bona fide miracle when somebody's sins are washed away. Amen. Two things, two things that is going to stop the judgment of God. Two things. Number one, it's going to be true repentance. True repentance has... Um, stopped God many times that I think that he ultimately wills that our hearts would be broken and submitted to him that we would humble ourselves that we would humble our pride um, to God amen the no the other thing that will get God's attention is obedience obedience to his will obedience to his law obedience to his word that if there are those two things that are in practice in your life, that um, you won't have to wonder where God is. He's attracted to those things. Have you ever found yourself, I imagine that you have, that we're praying the prayer, God, I want, I want to be doing the things that you're attracted to. Amen? I want, I want to be doing those, those things. Um, I'm just, I'm referencing this. This is the third time I've shared this, but I, I feel like it is a great reminder of the world that we live in. Not so much that I'm launching from, but again, uh, Pastor Wright was asked to open a new session of Kansas Senate. Everyone was expecting usually politically correct generalities, but they heard something instead a little bit stirring in prayer, passionate calling the country to repentance, righteousness. Bible says that sin approached to any nation. Anybody know the other side of that scripture? Righteousness exalts a nation. Sin is a reproach to anybody. But it's right living that exalts a nation. Um, but when they heard this, stirring prayer, the, I'm sorry, the response was immediate. The number of legislators walked out during the prayer. In six short weeks, the Central Christian Church of the United States had logged more than 5,000 phone calls with only 47 of those calls responding negatively. The commentator Paul Harvey aired the prayer on the radio and received a larger response to his program than any other program that had ever aired. The Central Christian Church is now receiving international requests for copies of the prayer in India, Africa, and Korea. Pastor Wright's prayer is reprinted here as an encouragement and challenge for each of us to stand for truth, the gospel, whenever the Lord gives us the opportunity. The prayer is this. Heavenly Father, has anybody ever heard this? No? Good. 
Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask for your forgiveness, to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we've done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our own values. We confess. We've ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it pluralism. We've worshiped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternate lifestyle. We've exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We've rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We've killed our unborn and called it choice. We've shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We've neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused, we have abused power and called it political savvy. We have con um, coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We've polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts today. Cleanse us from every sin. Let, let us, uh, or set us free. Um, set us free. Guide us and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of Kansas who have been ordained by you to govern this great state. Grant them the wisdom to rule. May their decisions direct us to the center of your will. I ask in the name of your son, love and savor Jesus Christ and amen. He said, I'm not as concerned about being politically correct as I am fulfilling the will of God, whose name is Jesus. We, I don't know what that does to you, but we live in difficult times, scary times, overwhelming times, dark times. Times like this, we need a savior. And to be, to be honest, to be transparent, to be direct, is that we can live in our own utopia of what we call Christianity, but at the very core of Christianity, there's always a battle. A.W. Tozer made a statement like this, a scared, a scarred world needs a fearless church. Can I say that, that in spite of our humanity, in spite of our limitations, in spite of our ups and downs, in spite of of the things that tug a war with our own heart, that we're not gonna get the job done just by showing up. At some point, we're gonna have to do more than just straddle the fence of spiritual, political correctness. And somebody's gonna have to pray, somebody's gonna have to war, somebody's gonna have to worship. In spite of what family says, in spite of what a world says, in spite of political correctness says. I, I, I went to the, the doctor, I think it was yesterday, I had an appointment and uh, saw a local pastor and we started talking about some of the end time stuff, some of the, the, the things that are going on in Israel. And, um, and we both concurred, but he made the statement. He says, I don't understand how he just, he had a, a major bout of cancer. He was in the hospital for a month. And uh, he said, well, Jay, that there's something that took place when I, um, when I got out of the hospital that um, God was talking to me every day when I was in the hospital that when I get out, that there's some things I don't need to give time to. He said, I'm, I'm, this is what he said. He said, I'm not listening to criticism anymore. At the end of the day, I can't fix you. I can't fix them. But I'm going to love God with all of my heart. He said, but, but truly, Brother Jay, how are people going to make it after the rapture if they can't make it before the rapture? I, again, I think that, that God help every one of us, help every one of us to understand that this thing called revival and prayer and this call to prayer, this call, if you will, to repentance is not just a good thing. We're not just trying to build up our numbers for numbers sake, but we're, if, if this church can truly find their heart in a repentant state, that we are not just, some, some people don't wanna go away from the shore. 
They don't want to go away from the shallows of repentance because it forces us to deal with things that we truly would rather not deal with. I believe that we must respond to this world's uh, issues with, with more than just a quiet, solemn, meditated prayer. But at some point, there's, there needs to be a lion's roar. At some point, there's need, there needs to be something that cries out from the inside of us that says, God, I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to be spotted by this world. I don't want to just go through the motions. I, I don't want to just be comfortable in church, but I want to live for you with all of my heart. And I say that today, Lord, in all of who I am, all of the good and all of the bad, all the sacred, all the profane. But God, I don't want to just go through the motions. I want you to make me in your image. I want you to wash my mind and wash my heart and wash my desires. Come on, there's dads that need something more than just a practice two-point prayer. There's somebody that needs to know how to intercede. I'm going to call on the name of Jesus. As the Bible teaches us, we're going to grab the horns of the altar and travail. The Bible says, when Israel travails, you cannot pacify the great needs with cheap, distracted, vain, repetitious prayer. We need prayer that's red hot and bold. We need prayer that is convictional and unconventional. We need prayer that is filled with passion and heavenly purpose. We need prayer that is practiced more than it's talked about. We need prayer that is saturated with the Holy Ghost and that is anchored in the Word of God. We need prayer that doesn't just recite the Lord's Prayer, but the prayer that prays the formula of the Lord's prayer. Not a prayer that just says, this is not biblical. Well, if it's the Lord's will, then he's going to do it. That's not, that's not the truth. The Bible says that there is something. If, if, if Jonah's people, if Nineveh would not have repented, that God would have destroyed that city, no matter how big it was. Come on, there, there, there could be. The only thing between you and your family is the travail of your heart, the travail of your soul. I don't want to just be a part of something. I want to be in till it's over my neck and say, God, create in me a clean heart. Last thing that Jesus did before he ascended after his three and a half years of ministry. The Bible says, and he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized. He that believeth and is baptized. It's not just what we say, it's what we do. It's the actions that follow our belief shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I think that Ian Bounds said it, said it best. He said, the, look, the church is looking for better methods, but God's looking for better men. I don't know how you, you measure up to that, but God, I pray this morning in prayer. God, help me align myself. It's not the method. Hear me, church. We can have the best methods. We can have the best technology. We can have all this stuff. But that screen is not going to save you. Those drums are not going to save you. Come on, the carpet and the floor, epoxy, it's not going to save. What's going to save us is I've got to have application of the word of God in my heart. I don't want to just be around passive while the world is not passive. Would you just raise your hands and thank God for his goodness right now? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God, I give you praise. God, I honor your name. God, I glorify your name. God, I'm asking for your touch right now. Asking for your ways to be accomplished in us. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, what the church needs today is not more machinery, or better, new organizations, more novel methods, but men and women of the Holy Ghost.
men and women of the Holy Ghost. God, help us, help Life Source, the men of Life Source, to be men of prayer, not just men of talent. Help our women to be women of prayer, not just women of abilities. Come on, everybody has an opinion. But have you saturated that opinion in the Word of God? All of us are guilty of weaponizing our opinion. God wants to anoint men and women. It's not the beauty of our church or of temples that God is attracted to. We know this. It's not the talent or the treasure that a man or a woman possesses that attracts God to man, but rather it's the priority and the passion that man, woman, boy, girl, when we surrender to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we have what we need to get to God. This morning in prayer, I filled up two and a half pages of notes as God began to deal with my heart. Not, not for you, he dealt with my heart for me. He began to talk to me about repentance. He began to tell me that sometimes we get, we get uh, uh, what's the word? We get comfortable, we get complacent in repentance. If you just pray what you've always prayed, how will you know that there are better methods, that there are other methods, that when we begin to pray, if we have a hard time, I'm just saying, we have a hard time praying more than five minutes, then there's probably a problem. We've got to expand that. We've got to know that. The Bible says a lot. I'm not reading all the scriptures, but Matthew 3, 1 through 2, John the Baptist came preaching. He said, repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4 and 17, a short time later, Jesus came on the scene proclaiming the same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Luke 5, 32, Jesus stated, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. If there is something out of kelter in my life, in my flesh, in my mind, in my spirit, can I tell you that God is not waiting with a ball bat, but God came to call us out of our sin, us out of our pain, us out of our comfort zone, us out of our complacency, us out of our apostasies. Come on, you know what a complacency is, right? I just kind of, complacency kills. I, I, the, the, the fire's not there. The, the, I'm just kind of going through the motions. It's kind of like apathy. I'm doing what I'm doing. Listen, it doesn't, listen, listen church. It doesn't matter how long you've been in church. That doesn't save you. What saves you is the application of the word of God. The Bible says, hear me. The Bible says even your own righteousness is filthy before God. Amen. Acts 2 and 38. Peter said, repent. Be baptized. One thing is something that I say. It's a change of mind. I'll get there. But baptism is obedience. Confess the word with the Lord with your mouth, you shall be saved. You can't take one scripture out of context. You can't build a doctrine out of one verse of scripture. You've got to line them all up. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is patient toward you, not willing that any would perish, but all would come to where? To repentance. Be patient. The Lord is patient toward us. When I feel like I've just done the worst, mercy shows up. His mercy is new every single morning because we need his mercy. I don't know about you, but it definitely wasn't this way when I came to God. And when I came to him and said, Lord, I just want you to know I want to serve you. And I didn't get the response that he said, oh, Michael, listen, I've not found a Christian like you in all the world. In fact, I'm so impressed. I'm going to change my authority and my word to fit you. He was not so impressed. He loves me so much, but if I make bad decisions, he'll let me eat, the Bible says, the dregs with it. 
If you drink the cup of sin, you'll, you'll be forced to drink the dregs, the little deposits in the bottom of the cup with it. But God, God is, is saying, listen, you don't, you don't understand my mercy. I, I'm not waiting. I'm going to get there. I'm not waiting for you to make a mistake so I can expose and, and bring. Sh no, no, no. Sh sin brings shame. Sin brings conflict. Amen? Come on. Anybody real in this room? Anybody know without the mercy of God we would all die? Revelations 2 and 3 in the letters churches of Asia Minor, Jesus admonishes the people to repent. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for repentance means to turn. When one repents, he is to turn from his sinful way, sinful life, and head in the direction of obedience to God. The Jonah story, chapter 3, the Jonah story is a great picture, a great picture of number one, it's hard for you to preach to others when you yourself become a castaway. My disclaimer to that is we're all trying to make heaven our home. We have all made mistakes. We have all fought against our pride. We have all the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Is there not a sinner amongst us? No, all have sinned. And this is an idea. This is a mindset. This is, that's why God wants repentance is the change or the turn of your mind, of your thought process. It changes the way we think about others. It changes the way we think about God. It changes the way we think about ourselves. When God begins to transform by the transforming of our mind. So, no, no, I want God to transform. I'm going to change my heart. Do you know biblically you can't change your heart? Do you know that? You can't change your heart. God didn't give you authority to change your heart. But he did give you the ability to change your mind. The Bible says your heart's deceitfully wicked. Who can know the heart of man? Nobody can. Only God, man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. Only God, he's a discerner between the thoughts and the intents of our heart. He's a discerner, yes he is, that God knows the difference between the bone and the marrow. Only God can do it. If you're saying, God, I want to change my heart for you, I want to change my affections, you don't get to do that. God has to do that. What we are responsible for is God help me to think different. I want, I want to build some habits in my mind that says I want to serve you every moment of every day. Of course that's a projection. Of course that's a target. But every day I want to wake up and hear the word of God in my heart. Every day I want to, I want to search the scripture. I do. I want to be a student of the word. But I've got to also learn how to rethink. One man said that when you come into faith mode, you, you can't deal with faith the way you always dealt with reason. Faith is going to be risky at times. When God saw in Nineveh, when God saw that he had put a stop to their evil ways, when they had put a stop to their evil ways, then he had mercy on them. He did not carry out the destruction that he threatened them with. Sin bringeth forth death. Sin brings forth death. So if you're going to research something, I think there's two things you need, to, you need to know. And you need to take it on yourself. You need to understand what God calls sin. Don't just ask people that are around you. You've got to get in the book. And you've got to find out what the Bible says. What does God say about sin? Because there's some really probing things. Because it wouldn't it be sad if we've gone through all of these motions and jumped through all of these hoops, but at the end of the day, I harbored some things that God is not attracted to. Amen? I need to know what, what he thinks is sin. And number two is, I need to surrender my heart through obedience to his plan. 
men of Nineveh, of Nineveh rather, will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Something happened to Jonah. Come on, does anybody have a story of God moving in your life? I'm asking. Do you have a story? How about the rest of you? Do you have a story what, that God has delivered you from some stuff? I think what, this, what, what happens in our life is that we, we, we just kind of put that on the back burner at times. Now, I think that God intended that our testimony be in front of us every single day so we never lose sight of the mercy and application in my life. Matthew said, no one greater than Jonah. The one greater than Jonah is Jesus Christ. The sinners should hear him and repent, just as the people of Nineveh heard the preaching of Jonah and they repented. I don't know everything that Jonah said specifically, but I do know this. He was not bashful. Somewhere between not wanting to fulfill the will of God, the whale experience, being spit out on shore, hearing the voice of God a second time, that he got over himself. And he walked into a day's journey to Nineveh, to the, almost the heart and soul of a city. And he began to proclaim it to the point that rumors made their way all the way up to the king. And the king was convinced that if in 40 days God is going to destroy this place, then the only thing that's going to stop judgment is going to be repentance. I believe that, that we have the authority, if you will, to grant God's mercy in our city, to grant God's mercy in our home and in our family, if we will just travail before God and say, we need mercy. I repent, wash my mind. The Bible says that true repentance brings godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7 is where I'm at. Paul taught that godly sorrow is required for true repentance to take place. It was once said by Ezra Benson, he made the statement, it's not uncommon to find men and women in the world who feel remorse for the things that they do wrong or did wrong. Sometimes this is because their actions cause them or loved ones great sorrow and misery, conflict. Sometimes their sorrow is caused by they are caught with their hand in the cookie jar and punishment comes for their actions. Such worldly feelings does, listen, does not constitute godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is because it got caught. Godly sorrow leads us to repentance. It leads us to a thing in Psalms 51 called a broken and a contrite heart. I don't think that we are all born with an overwhelming passion to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Sometimes isn't that hard? Articulate. We have it in our head. It's just hard to come out with our mouth. Sometimes it's my pride that makes the mess even bigger. Amen? Repentance comes from two words. Meta, which means change, or metamorphosis is the word that we get from it. And noia means mind. So in the Greek, just to say it's 180 degrees turning in the opposite direction and going that way, although the concept fits, but it literally means to change one's mind. The way that we deal. You know, we used to be filled with greed, but now generosity. It's a mindset, right? We used to hold on to that, that issue, that resentment, that grudge, whatever. But now we are walking in forgiveness because of a mind change. We used to deal with this. The Bible says, a soft answer turneth away 
wrath. That's not a world concept. That's a God concept. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind, which is a process. Matthew, remember when John the Baptist preached in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I think this is important for us to note. And also Matthew 4 and 17, at the same time Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That repentance has, has such a negative connotation. It has such a judgment or else. Repent or else. Broken shame. I'm falling apart. Broken pieces on the floor. Um, you know, I, I, need, I need God to forgive me. But really, really when you look at repentance, it, it is a really positive thing. It is a really positive thing. Repentance is a thing that says that I'm going to get some stuff out of the way. I'm going to get some things that I've been contemplating, some thoughts that I've had. I'm going to put some blinders, if you will. I'm going to change some of the, the functions of my life so that I don't go back where I came from. When I trip, I'm going to get back up as fast as possible because God wants to use this life. God wants to bring blessing. God wants to bring strength. God wants to help. He, he said this. John said it. Jesus said it. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Bible says in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, he says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can, can I tell you that God wants heaven to come down into your house? God wants heaven to come down into your relationship. God wants heaven. And so one of the reasons why I do it is not because I, I, I don't want to go to hell, but the reason that I'm getting some stuff out of, my, out of my mind, out of my heart, that I'm trying to say, God, there is better in front of us, but we can't get to the heavenly stuff with sin undealt with. Proverbs, <laughs> just listen to Solomon. Whosoever loveth instruction, the word means correction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish, which is translated to mean stupid. He who loves correction, correction loveth knowledge. But he who hateth correction is not very wise. The Bible, the Bible teaches us, teaches us that many of us, when we came to Jesus, that we knew we were messed up. What a revelation to keep in our life. You know what happens when we don't keep that revelation in front of us? Pride. Starts bowing up. Entitlements start bowing up. We start saying, I don't need an altar. I'm good. Knowing that our own heart is deceitfully wicked, we always need an altar. And I know when I veer from an altar, guess who shows up? Selfishness, pride, lust of the flesh is manifested, lust of the eyes are manifested. Relationships are complicated. Now this is not a Bible translation or transliteration, but this is my definition of sin. This is not King James. It's removing the junk. Repentance is removing the junk the junk in my mind, the junk in my heart, the clutter that gets in the way. Remember that I was, I was praying not too long ago and um, I felt like the Lord was, was talking to me. I felt the little nudge. He says, how is it that I can give you stuff from heaven if your hands are full with your own clutter? We, we, we've gotten really good, if we're honest, 
We've gotten really good at carrying all of our memorabilia of our own life, legends in our own mind. We've created our own Christianity. Ask us. Because we do things more out of emotion than we do out of biblical truth. If you have ought against your brother, let him have it. But that's not what the Bible teaches, right? Point our fingers at all. That's, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that Jesus said, forgive them for their ignorance. Jesus and Stephen lay this not to their charge. I'm not saying I'm there. I'm not saying you're there. But the door that opens the blessings of the Lord, the treasures of the Lord, is hinged on this thing called repentance. That sometimes that I have found myself at a door of, of comfort. That I've done it this way all of my life. And I'm telling you, that's not the will of God. That there should always, what are we doing this for? The Bible says to us that have been in church, that be thou an example in your words. Be an example in your conversations. Be an example in your purity. Be an example in your faith. Be an example in your worship. One of the most major challenges of repentance. One of the most major challenges of repentance is simply this, letting go. Letting go. Sometimes I've, I've lived so long with it. There, there's two sides of this. Number one is if I let go, what do I have? It's, it's not just what I carry. It's become my crutch. It's become, it's become if you will, my third leg. It, it, it's become identifiably with me. Letting go is, is the first thing. Anybody remember the first thing when Joshua brought the children of Israel out of wandering out of the wilderness, the first place they stopped. Anybody remember? Anybody remember the first practice that they did before they ever went to Jericho? They went to Gilgal. Anybody remember that? For 40 years, the men had never been circumcised. The Abrahamic covenant. So they sharpened their knives in a very physical thing, but we look spiritually. Sometimes that we can go through life and situations through church. We've been in church. We know, the, we, we know what's coming next. We know the format. We know the formula. And what happens is we say, ah, I, don't want, I don't want the knife. I don't want the blade in my life. And so we, we end up with these faith um, mutations. Biblical mutations that are not found here. We just have kind of manipulated scripture. I'm not, I'm not preaching this because you're so wrong or you're, but I'm telling you, this is a, 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 an idea, a message, a word from God that, that we've got, we've got to do more than just talk about repentance. God, if I get good at anything, no matter what tomorrow looks like, I've got to get good at repentance where I go and tie myself to an altar and say, not my will, but thy will be done. You know what? Because if my flesh is in the way it's gonna mess up stuff when revival explodes it's amazing what we can accomplish when nobody's worried about who gets who gets the credit right John the Baptist had one message what was that message repent repent kingdom of heaven is at hand he didn't have eight levels of faith he didn't have a message called, can these bones live? He didn't have a message called the phenomenon of creation. He didn't preach about the red heifer and principles of the tabernacle plan. He didn't preach about water baptism, if you will, the oneness of God. He preached about repentance because if we do not repent, everything else doesn't matter. He preached repent. Because the kingdom of heaven, not hell has enlarged yourself, but the kingdom of heaven is him. And he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose laces I am not worthy to unloose. I don't repent because I got caught sometimes, sometimes. Shame and gut punches us. Shouldn't have 
shouldn't have, shouldn't have. And the shame, and it seems like the quicker I can get it out, God, help us as a church fan. Help me as a man, as a priest in my home, to be that, that guy that when I've done wrong, God, help me to own it as quickly as possible. God, I need your help. I don't always want to. It's not, it's not comfortable, is it? Oh, would you raise your hands and love the Lord for a minute? Oh, God. Of course we're not perfect. Of course we're not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. John preached one sermon. I don't know. I'm not asking your opinion. I, I can't wrap my mind around this. Sunday, come to church. I'm going to preach about repentance. Wednesday, I'm going to preach about repentance. Next Sunday, a whole year's worth. I'm going to just preach repentance, repentance, repentance. I guarantee you people would stop coming. You know... Is that it? Like, like, the, like the one person that asked the pastor, I heard a story years ago. He says, uh, you preach the same message several services. And the pastor with boldness, kindness, he says, well, when you start doing it, I'll get another sermon. Because sometimes we are just sermon junkies. Show me something new. Show me something. Give me some of that revelation. And it's all about candy sticks. And it's all about the eschatology and end times. And let's talk about the red hair. I'm telling you what, I thank God for what's happening and, and all this. But, but if we do not learn how to repent when there is sin in our heart or when we are drifting over left of center, that we've got to know that it, if, 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 if you don't come, I still have to know how to repent. If, if we don't come, I still, if it's on a Sunday or a Tuesday or a Monday or a Wednesday, it doesn't matter. I've got to know how to repent. My kids need to learn how to repent your kids need to know it's it's not i can't do it when we get to heaven it's it's not going to be me saying hey listen it's okay that that time's going to be over god baptize us what, what's the the city in kentucky that had the big prayer revival thing asbury they cancel everything i'm not saying you got i'm saying god meets us at the level of willingness, not even the level of expectation. God, I want you. I want you. You get to set the determination of how far you take communion with you, how far you take this message with you. Ah, it's uncomfortable. Okay. We lose sight of the blood and the gore of a spotless lamb, an innocent animal being killed because of the sin of a family and it's pushed forward. It's not popular. God knows that's true. It's not popular. Political realms don't want to hear it. Most churches don't want to hear it. They want to hear how wonderful they are, how blessed they are, how God's going to move in spite of it. I'm, but I'm telling you what, at some point, somebody's got to open the book of truth and say, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit. That's not my words, ladies and gentlemen. That's John 3 and 5. That's what the Bible says. Repentance is changing the way I think, changing the way I think about us, changing the way I think about him, changing the way I think about my struggles and my selfishness and my doubts and my fears and my anxieties, the hidden things of my heart. One man of God said, he said, we can't change our hearts. We can change our minds. A broken and a contrite spirit, the Bible says. If you look at Psalms 51, I'm almost done. Psalms 51, the Bible says that David opens up several times, have mercy according to thy steadfast love, according to thy abundant mercy. According to your promises, have mercy on me. There's something about walking into the presence of God. There's something about walking into my day saying, God, your mercies are new, but I need those applied to me. They're just, it's not enough for me to just quote the scripture. I need it applied to me. God, would you help me? God, I need strength. I need direction. I need to be able to walk with you. Have mercy on me, Psalms 51. Oh God, according to thy love and kindness, according to thy multiple tender mercies, 
multiple, multitude of tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly with thy, uh, from mine iniquity, my sin. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before thee, against thee, and thee only have I sinned. He keeps on going. He says, purge me with hyssop. It's the hyssop branch that they used in the Passover. And as they killed the lamb, he stuck the hyssop, the little bush branch type thing, if you will. They got it and they put it on the doorpost. Back, back, as they're getting ready to come out of, of Egypt bondage. It was that same, he said, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. What he's saying is, apply the blood upon my heart, upon my door, upon my mind, upon my ears. I plead the blood of Jesus. Come on, but if, if you never are challenged beyond the way that you've always prayed, I'm telling you, at some point, at some point, it's not hard to pray long if you have a cheat sheet. It's not hard to pray long when you've put some notes together and say, God, before I ask you for anything, bathe me in blood, wash me. God, I wasn't just baptized. My sins were washed away. Come on. It wasn't because of the location of the tub. It was because of the name of Jesus that washed my sins away. And because of that, I don't want any, I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell, but I want to know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. My goodness. Make me to hear joy and gladness. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, renew a right spirit within me. The longer I stay away from an altar of transparency, honesty, and truth, the more I begin to take on and live a lie. I don't know how this resonates in your own heart. I don't know the application. I don't know your mind right now. But what I do know is this. We cannot be who God has called us to be. I cannot be. There has been times. There has been times that I have wandered on purpose from repentance. Because I knew God was want to go through that door that I did not want to go through. He was going to ask questions I didn't want to answer. I just, if I ignored it, it goes away. But God loves us so much. I'm closing with this. The mercy of God, I've said this before, but it just, it, it always hits me in my forehead. It always gets me. Judas. You know, Judas became really critical over the money. What in the world? Are you letting her give this alabaster box? Do you not know how many people it could have fed? could feed so many people. Why are we doing this? Jesus is saying, take it away. Why is it that Jesus, who knows the end from the beginning, isn't that what the Bible says? He's the author and the finisher of our faith, right? He knows the total end and he knows the total beginning. Before the world, he was. God has always been. So doesn't it make sense that God knew Judas's issue before he ever let him be a part of his team. <laughs> and he let him be a part of his team. I don't know that we would have done that. Because some people won't let some people's past go away. Now, how biblical is that? I don't care what you say. Where's the Bible in that? Okay. Jesus is at the table. Jesus has a conversation with Judas at the table that we're not sure that anybody else heard. Finally, Jesus says, what you do, do quickly. Judas, I believe this. Judas could have had the noose around his neck because he went out and hung him. 30 pieces of silver, all that mess. He could have had the noose on before he stepped off. He said, you know, what am I thinking? This is stupid. I've seen him forgive people. He could have started walking back to the house where Jesus was sitting. This is ridiculous. He loves me. I may not agree with him. 
He, he could have the whole way back to the house, walked in, come to Jesus' feet, knelt down and said, Lord, I'm sorry. I made a mess of this. I made this something it's not supposed to be. I am sorry. That, that's what a repentant heart does. A prideful heart says, fooey on you, you're wrong. His own pride would not let him repent. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, when we get in ourselves that says, I don't need an altar? Where did you read that in the Bible? Where did you see that you don't have to have a broken and a contrite? You know that broken, bro, we understand broken, but contrite, it means broken pieces. What David was saying is I'm not just broken, but I never want to leave the brokenness that brings you to me. I want to be pliable. I want to be putty in your hands. I want to be, I want to be like, like the potter's wheel, the clay in the potter. That's what I want. Come on, somebody. God in this, I don't have the, the nth degree of understanding of what's going to happen tomorrow and if the, the heifers are going to be sacrificed. If they are, fine. If, if, if it takes a year for Jesus to come back or it's next week, my point, the message that we should hear as the church here, the core of our church is we've got to repent. We've got to repent. We've got to be buried in the name of Jesus. We've got to have the Spirit of God alive and moving inside of us. Stand. I don't, when I got to prayer this morning, I, there are just some times that you just kneel down to God. It took me some time before I had the words because I said, God, you, it's a new day. Create in me a clean heart. I don't have the wisdom for tomorrow without your help. I don't have the understanding without your help. When I surrender, when I raise my hands and say, God, you don't owe me anything. Come on. It is that music without worship is a concert, ladies and gentlemen. It's a concert. When we begin to worship, it doesn't matter what they're saying. When we're led of the Holy Ghost, and sometimes it just stops. And all of a sudden, worship begins to fill the auditorium. And lives are transformed by the renewing of the Holy Ghost. I wonder if you would, for a moment, surrender yourself one more time. I can't make you do it. I can't just tell you what to say. You've got to unlock it for yourself. God, I surrender. Not my will. Thy will be done. Mold me. Shape me. If you find that part of the clay that is stubborn, keep on working on it. God, there's not one perfect in this room. But I didn't just come to get a, a church t-shirt and feel religious. The wooing. I'm telling you. Not everybody in our culture is preaching repentance. Not everybody is saying you come to an altar and you're conformed, transformed. Some just give me a sticker. Come on, somebody. Come on, elders. Come on, priests of your home. Come on, mom. Come on, dad. Is it your talent? Is it your stuff? Or today, God, let it be my heart. Let it be my mind. Create in me. Create in me. Clean heart. Don't come to it's that place of transformation so start with me nobody can do it for you no, there's no substitute for you 
Only you can pray the prayer. God, I surrender my thoughts. I surrender my mind. Oh, God, help me clean up my mess. Help me. Help me clean up my mess. Help me. Oh, God. Search my heart. Search my thoughts. Search the things that I think that I sometimes don't say when I should say. God, touch my mind. Come on, somebody. Come on, that's why you've got to subject your flesh. It's not comfortable. You've got, you've got to pray until you pray through. And only you know how to push until you push through. Faith until you.